Okay, you can start. Okay. Aswarya, you are an audible? I think so. Yes. Yes, all are audible. Start now? Let's start. Okay. It's still not one. Do you want to wait for one more minute? It's 12.59 for me. Okay. No, it's your choice. Yes, yes, no problem. Wait for one minute. Now, start. You are audible, Aishwarya? I think so. You are able to hear me, right? Then start now? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alisha Priya, working as an assistant professor in mechatronic department, Parul Institute of uh, Technology at Parul University, Badodra, Gujarat. I welcome you all for today's webinar on introduction for ASIC Pro and Eco implementation. I welcome Ms. Ashwarya Kumari. She is a lead application engineer at Cadence System Design, Bangalore. She is working with Cadence for the past five years. She has done a master degree in VLSI design as embedded system from NIT Raurkela and is pursuing a part-time PhD from IIT Mandi. She has various publications with Springer and Cadence Life India. So thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. Without wasting much time, over to you, Shwarya. Thank you, Alicia, ma'am. It was a great introduction. <laughs> uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Let me just quickly share my screen. And Alicia, you can confirm if you can see my screen. Okay. Is the screen visible? Yes. Okay. And you are seeing this in a slide show mode, right? Not in the business. Uh, slide. Means it's a full screen. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, then without okay. further ado, let's get started. So once again, okay. good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today we are going to talk about introduction to a six design flow and ESO implementation. Uh, as Alicia ma'am also introduced me that I am uh, Ashwara Kumari. I'm a lead application engineer at Cadence Design Systems. I've been with Cadence for almost uh, five years now. And uh, okay, then let's get started with the current topic. So today we are going to uh, discuss about what and why we do this ASIC design flow. We are not going to go uh, into so much of details of how we do it, but just an overview. Okay, so let's quickly go through the agenda for today. So we will start with what is ASIC. Let me just quickly change my pointer to laser. Okay, so we will start with what ASIC uh, is actually, and uh, then we will talk about uh, various design steps that we'll need to perform for designing the six. So we'll talk about front-end design, back-end design. Uh, I'll be going through these steps that we perform for each of these steps in uh, detail in the upcoming slides. And in the end, we'll talk about what ECU implementation is, why do we need it, and uh, at what stages we can perform it. Okay, so that that's the uh, quick agenda for today's call. Let's get started. 
so let's start with understanding what an asic is right so asic basically stands for application specific integrated circuit as the name suggests that it can perform a specific application it can perform a particular task for which it has been designed right uh, during your project work or lab work you might have worked with fpga board so fpga basically provides us a hardware which we can uh, decode multiple times with different different rtl and verify r as well so basically it's a reprogrammable option that we have but in case of asic reprogramming is not an option so what we do is it can only work for a particular functionality so uh, let's suppose uh, the example of the camera chip on your phone right so that chip can only be used for camera application it cannot be used for any other application if we want any other functionality we'll have to design another asic for the same uh, for the functionality that we require okay so then uh, the question that might come your mind would be that then why are we even using it it's not giving us the option to reprogrammability also right so there are various reasons of that but the uh, two major ones are size and performance like i have listed here right we have the advantage over shrinking size and better performance uh, so what do i mean by shrinking size uh, nowadays uh, in market we constantly get a requirement from more or more or more shrink size devices right in today's market we have designs which are uh, working with 5 nanometer technology and we also have 3 nanometer technology available uh, libraries available which can be used for designing so with asic we are able to keep up with the shrinking size of the devices that's that's one uh, uh, plus point that asic provides other than that we have performance right so even with these shrinking nodes shrinking sizes of the device we are able to get a better performance we are able to get a better operating frequency we are able to get a low power consumption so that's why uh, nowadays asic is very widely used right so let's quickly go through on uh, how we design an asic and uh, also what steps we make sure is happening so that we are getting a better performance so we'll go through each and every steps and then uh talk about the ecu as well okay so let's look into the steps so as a design uh, basically happens in two parts first is front end design and then back end design so we'll talk about both let's at first start with the front end design so in front end design also we will be having different steps that we need to perform uh like i have mentioned here so these are all the steps that we we'll need to uh, perform in front end design i'll be going through each and every step of these one by one and also if you have any query feel free to interrupt me in between and you can uh, uh, like uh, ask your doubts okay so let's get started let's talk about the first step that we'll need to run with front end design so the first step is design specification and hello hello hello
हेलो यार इसको फोन करो मैम इस लिंक से आप ज्वाइन करके देखो एक बार किससे अरे तो यहाँ डिस्कनेक्ट हो गया वहां कैसे आएगा कॉल कर लेती हेलो हेलो यस यस सॉरी आई थिंक वाज अ पावर कट डिस्कनेक्टेड या या ओके लेट मी रीशेयर I hope I am audible right now, right? Yes, yes. More confirm. You can start. I can start, right? So, can you please confirm where I was when uh, the disconnectivity happened? Uh, so I think uh, yes, yes. This slide. Front end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll start from here itself. Okay. So I was talking about the design specification and micro architecture. So at this stage, what we are trying to make sure is that we are aware that what functionality our IT is going to perform, and uh, in what area and at what frequency of operation. So do, these will be the requirements that we'll need to make sure that our, our IC is working with. Okay. So uh, let's take an example. Here I've taken an example of a vending machine. Let me quickly change my pointer once again. So here I've taken an example of a vending machine. So this is a vending machine, which has a functionality that whenever there is a total sum of fifteen rupees inserted in the machine, there will be one item which will be dispensed. Okay, and the coin that it can uh, work with are five rupees coin and ten rupees coin. So that would be the functionality. We also want our vending machine to return change. Let's suppose someone has inserted ten uh, rupees, uh, sorry, twenty rupees. Okay, so in that case. what it will do is it will uh, uh, dispense an item and also return a 5 rupees change so this is the basic functionality that we want our ic to perform right and i'm i'll be taking this example throughout this presentation for all the stages so we'll be using the same example for throughout this presentation so let's look at this uh, vending machine functionality into a little bit more detail like what it will be doing how it will be doing okay so in my vending machine there would be three states s0 s1 and s2 s0 here represents that we are starting the operation so now machine has no coin inserted in it and it's just waiting for a coin to be inserted okay the second state is s1 s1 represents that a total sum of 5 rupees has already been inserted in the machine it's waiting for the next coin and s2 represents that the total sum of 10 rupees has already been inserted in the machine and it's waiting for the next coin and as i already mentioned then the product will only be dispensed when the total sum of 15 has been inserted okay so let's look at the state assignment table so the state assignment table here has three states as i mentioned s0 will represent start of the operation s will be representing that uh, Five rupees has already been inserted. S two represents that ten rupees has already been inserted. So we'll be having one encoded uh, numbers for these states. So zero zero will represent S zero zero one and one zero for S one and S two, uh, respectively. Okay, and each and every state here will have three kinds of input available or input possible. Here zero zero represents that. machine is waiting for the coin and we have not inserted any coin so that would mean that we are not inserting any further coin that is 00, 00 means 0 rupees inserted 01 will represent that we are inserting a 5 rupees coin right i mentioned earlier also right that my machine can only accept a 5 rupees coin or a 10 rupees coin so with 01 we are representing that 5 rupees coin is being inserted and with 10 we are representing that 10 rupees coin has been inserted so these are the three input possible and these three inputs are with each and every state even for s1 only these three inputs are possible for s2 also these three inputs are only possible right so let's see what happens at s0 when we are providing these three inputs at s0 if we are not providing any coins means my input is 00 in that case machine will not be moving to the next state it will be remaining in the same s0 state itself 00 here represents s0 state 
that will be remaining in S0 state. There will be no output and there will be no change. Out here represents that the product is dispensed and change here represents that the, the remaining uh, money has been returned at us as a change, okay? So at S0, if we are inserting a five rupees coin, then my machine will move to zero one state, which represents to S1. So it will be moving to S1 state and still the total sum is not 15, right? So there will be no output, there will be no change. At S0, if you are inserting a 10 rupees coin, and in that case, the machine will be moving to one zero state, which is my S2 state, okay? So with one zero, we're moving to S2 state and still the total sum is not 15. So there will be no output, there will be no change. So this is with S0. Let's look at S1 state, what will happen? S1 here represents that total sum of five has already been inserted in the machine. So at S1, if we are not inserting any further coin, then what would happen is that machine will wait for a particular time limit. And then if still there is no coin has been inserted, it will move to the S0 state, which is the start of the operation. There will be no product dispensed, but we already had a five rupees coin inside the machine, right? So it will return that file as a change, okay? At S1, if we are inserting a five rupees coin, then what would happen? Then we will have a total sum of 10 rupees. It's still not 15, so no output, no change. But since now the machine has 10 rupees, the next state will be S2, which is one zero. If we are inserting a 10 rupees coin, so we inserted a 10 rupees coin, machine already had a five rupee coin inside it. So now the total sum is 15. So since the total sum is 15, now the product will be dispensed. My out is one, no change because we have inserted a total sum of 15 itself. And the next state now will become the start of the operation because the product has already been dispensed. Now the machine will go to the S0 state. Now let's look at S2 state. So at S2 state, we are aware that machine already has a 10 rupee coin inside it. So if we are not inserting any coin at, at, after a particular time limit, machine will reset, it will go to the S0 state. It will not give any product uh, item. And the 10 rupees that it had, it will, uh, it will return in the back by giving us change. And as at S2, if we are inserting a five rupees coin, then what would happen? Now the total sum becomes 15. So this 15 will be having my product dispensed, no change, and machine will go to the start of the operation. And what if we are inserting a 10 rupees coin? Machine already had a 10 rupees, we are inserting a 10 rupees coin. So now the total sum is 20. So in this case, machine will give us a product, it will also give us a five rupees change and go to the start of the operation. So this is the basic functionality of my vending machine that I want. So now the functionality we are aware of, we know the requirement that what do I want my vending machine to perform? Now, what would be the next step? So my design specification is finished. Now we'll move to the next step. The next step will be RTL design. So what do we do in RTL design? Uh, so we have the functionality, right? But we'll also now need a RTL code which will perform this functionality. So we'll need to write a RTL for the functionality itself. So the RTL can be written in any hardware description language uh, like VHDL, Verilog, System Verilog, etc. Here I have taken a code in Verilog. So to write a RTL code, we'll need to create a vending machine module and provide what would be the input and output for the system. And we'll also need to define the states that we have been talking about, right? So we'll need to create all the three states and we'll need to have registers uh, specifying current state and next state. And according to the inputs, we'll need to create the case statement. Like if we look at the S0 state here, as I discussed earlier, right? S0 state, We'll have three possible inputs. You are inserting no coin, you are inserting a five rupees coin, you are inserting a 10 rupees coin. So what would happen if you are not inserting any coin? Next state will remain S0 itself. There would be no output, there would be no change. At S0, if you are inserting a five rupees coin, which is zero one, 
then in that case, my machine will move to S1 state. There would be no output, there would be no change. And at S0, if we're giving a 10 rupees coin, then it will move to a S2 state. There would be no output, there would be no change. So like this, from our state assignment table itself, we can write out the complete Verilog code. Now we have our Verilog code. We are aware of the functionality. What would be the next step? Okay. So the next step here would be verifying whether or not my RTL that I have coded, right, is working properly. For that, the next step would be simulation and functional verification. So what do we do with simulation and functional verification? Here, what we would be doing is that uh, we, would, we would simulate our RTL with the test bench. Test bench is basically a very log file which would be having all the possible input scenarios uh, available. Okay, so we'll be simulating our RTL along with the test bench with any of the simulation softwares, like the waveform here is from uh, Incisive from Cadence. So we can simulate our RTL with the test bench and then it will provide us a output waveform for all the inputs that has been listed in the test bench. Okay, so this is the output waveform for the vending machine that uh, we just discussed about. Um, one more thing to uh, notice here that all my outputs and inputs are in sync with the positive edge of the clock. So whenever there is a change in output happening, it's synced with the positive edge of my clock that I have defined for the vending machine module. So let's see a few of the uh, scenarios here. Uh, let's start with the first one itself. My current state is zero. That means my machine has no coin inserted. Okay, and the input that I am providing is 0, 1. That means I have inserted a 5 rupees coin. Then what would happen? It should go to the S1 state, right? So the next state that I have is S1 state, right? F. And now let's go to the next scenario. My current state is now S1, and the input that I have provided is a 10 rupee coin. Then 10 plus 5 will become 15, right? So we'll need to get an output as well. The machine should be giving an output as well. So my out is becoming one. There is no change. So this is going well with the functionality that we have planned. Uh, let's look at the last scenario as well. So my current state is S2. S2 means that my machine already has a 10 rupee coin inserted in it, right? And what is the input that we are providing? The input that we are providing is 10 rupee coin. Then my total sum is 20. That means the product should be dispensed. So my out is one and we should also get a five rupee change. So like this, we'll need to validate all the uh, output scenarios, whether or not my functionality is correct. If everything is working fine, then we can go to the next state. If not, then we'll need to figure out what went wrong with the code and fix it. And then again, rerun simulation and figure out now whether it is working fine or not. Okay. So after simulation functional verification, what would be the next step? So the next step would be logic synthesis. Now, what do we do in logic synthesis? Uh, in logic synthesis, what we basically do is that we have our RTL code. Now, we'll be converting our RTL code into a gate level netlist. Uh, let's suppose that my RTL code has uh, y equal to a and b. So, when we synthesize this code, what we will get is a two input AND gate. This two input AND gate will be having A and B as the input and Y as the output. So basically we are converting our RTL code to the basic gates. So from where these basic gates will be coming. So let's look at the inputs that synthesis will be needing. So I have uh, listed here the minimum inputs needed for running the synthesis. So we would need library files, we would need RTL files and STC. We have already discussed about the RTL files in the uh, previous slide. So let's look at what library file is and what an STC is. Okay. So library files will be basically provided by the technology vendor. So this would be containing um, the basic standard cells that we need for the design, like AND gate, OR gate, inverters, buffers, etc. It will also be containing the operating conditions, like I have listed here in a snippet, right? So it will also be containing what is the process node, what is the temperature, what is the voltage, okay? And along with it, we'll also be having uh, lookup tables that we will use for our timing analysis. 
and it will also be having the leakage power numbers for different states of the input when input one input is high other one is zero then how much is the leakage so all those information will be provided by technology vendor in terms of library file so those will be the information present in my library so that's all about library let's look at what sbc is here sbc stands for standard design constraints so as the name suggests there will be design constraints listed in an sbc file so which kind of design constraints first of all like i mentioned previously right like we want our outputs and inputs to be in sync with the clock so we'll need to know what would be my clock period so the clock period how the clock waveform will be everything will be listed in stc file uh, along with it if there is any input and output delay that we need to consider while designing will be there in stc file as well and if there is some uncertainty also that we'll need to take care of that also would be listed in the sdc file like this similarly will be some multi cycle path false path all those things will also be coming into the sdc file okay so these will be the minimum inputs that synthesis required and as an output from logic synthesis we will get a synthesized netlist and a written out stc okay so what basically synthesis is doing synthesis is taking our rtl code and then converting it to a gate level design where the gates are being picked from the library files and along with it we'll also be doing our timing area and power analysis to make sure that my design is meeting all the criteria that we have listed okay so yeah that's all about logic synthesis so for synthesis also there are various uh, synthesis tools that are available in market which designers will be using to do the automatic synthesis and after the synthesis now what would be the next step so we have converted our rtl code to a gate level design now we'll need to make sure that the conversion happen properly okay so the next step will be equivalence check what do we do in equivalence check so in equivalence check we are basically making sure that while conversion the logic which we intended with the rtl code is not changed it's it's remaining the same only okay so how we will be doing that so as an input we will be needing our rtl file and the synthesized netlist and also the libraries we will basically be comparing my rtl design to the gate level netlist and after the comparison we should get an eq result if there is any non eq that has been flagged here then that needs to get fixed in the synthesis itself we we'll need to go back to synthesis fix the problem and then we we'll need to rerun the equivalence check we don't want our logic to be changed because the functionality we want as it is for our chip to be right so this equivalence check should be giving the equivalent result so that's what we do with logic equivalence check moving on to the next step so till here what we did was front end design what do i mean by front end design so all the stages that we saw till now right is only giving you output in the form of very logged netlist means it's a text format still it's a text format but what do we want eventually we want a physical chip to develop we want an ic to develop right so we'll need to take care of the physical aspects as well so those will be coming in back end design so in back end design the first step that we'll need to perform is place and route what do we do with place and route so at this step we'll need to be aware of how my code would look what would be the uh, what would be its height its width all dimensions which kind of metal layers i'm going to use in this uh, chip uh, their minimum spacing rules all these things we need to be aware of so basically we will need some input which will have the physical aspects as well right so what would be that So the input files, the minimum input files that we'll need are synthesized netlist that we got after logic synthesis, libraries, STC, and LEF file. Now LEF here will be having the physical information that we need. LEF stands for Liberty Exchange Format. So this will be having the physical information about the library cells that we have. we have used and along with that it will also have the metal layer specifications which kind of metal layers we are going to use their drc rules all those things will be listed in lef so lef will be the one which will be taking care of all the physical aspects 
now in case of placement route we'll be running multiple stages in placement route as well like i've listed here floor planning power planning self placement cts routing etc so we'll be going through this in the upcoming slides and uh, as we want my timing area and power requirement also to be fulfilled right so after each and every stage we will be performing timing analysis as well we'll also be verifying our design rule checks connectivity etc after post route so let's start with the floor planning also i'm not going to go into very much details i'm just going to tell you what floor planning is and which kind of aspects we set so in case of floor planning we are basically telling uh, whichever uh, place and route tool we are using that which uh, what would be my core how it will look so we'll need to tell the uh, height to width ratio core utilization core utilization here means that uh, at what percentage of my core my standard cells are being placed and after that how much percentage would be left out okay so that we would mean with core utilization so we'll need to provide all these details once we are filling up all these details we will be getting i uh, r core as shown in the right hand side image of this slide so this this is how my core would be okay once we have the core area specified on which we are going to work from now on onwards the next step will be power planning so what do we do in power planning in power planning the first step that we do is providing the power ring the ring the square ring that you see outside is the power ring so we'll need to provide the details about this power ring that which kind of metal layer we are going to use so for power ring we basically select the uh, topmost metal layers why do we do that is because um, the topmost layers will have uh, lowest resistance since power lines will be uh, uh, everywhere right because for standard cells also will need to connect the power so we want the minimum uh, drop on them so that's why we choose a minimum resistance uh, power layers metal layers okay so with that we will be placing our power rings after that we'll also be creating power stripes the stripes that you see here so what is the use of these stripes as i mentioned that we are going to place the standard cells here right so these standard cells should have easy access to the power lines so for that we create these stripes like when we place the cell here we'll have the easy access to all the power lines so this is what we do in the power planning we create a ring we create the stripes which are needed and after that we'll move to the cell placement cell placement as the name suggests that after this we are going to place the cell on my core so like you can see right here we have uh, out underscore reg placed there are some combo cells placed here g8 to 3 g8 to 8 1 so like this we'll be placing all our standard cells on my uh, core right once the cells are placed the next step would be clock tree synthesis so what is clock tree synthesis um let's suppose there is a register placed here on my core okay and another register placed here on the upper right corner and uh, assume that this is my clock source so the time for clock to reach to the first flop will not be same as the time for the clock to reach in the upper right corner flop because now the clock has to propagate through, uh, through so many cells and then reach here so there would be a delay so the intention of clock tree synthesis is to make sure that this delay is minimized we we'll need to avoid this delay so that everything gets a uh, clock at a similar time right so for that we will we'll have different clock structures like h tree so with that we will make sure that our clock is ticking at almost same times for all the flops so that's called clock tree synthesis after that we will be routing the design routing the design that would mean that we'll be making all the connections like you see the red wires getting connected to all the standard cells so we'll route our design once the design is routed then we can do rc extraction rc extraction is basically for sign off Uh, at that time we'll also be using the metal layers r and c values to see whether or not my timing power area is still meeting so for that we'll do rc extraction and once everything is going fine then we can do the uh, we can take out the gds2 this gds2 is what we'll forward to the foundry for developing our ic okay so we'll need to send this to the foundry to develop the ic 
But before sending that, we'll still need to make sure that my design is logical equivalent and uh, uh, it's also meeting the criteria of PPA, right? So then before sending out the GDS2, we'll do a logic equivalence check again. So now we'll be comparing our synthesized netlist to post layout netlist, okay? So the drill remains same. They will be comparing our synthesized netlist with the post layout netlist. We'll also need the libraries here. And the compare result should come as equivalent. If the result is not equivalent, we'll need to go back to the place and route step, fix the problem that we have been seeing, and then rerun equivalence checks to get an EQ result. So that's what we do for equivalence check. Okay, once the design is equivalent, we know that now the design is EQ, all the logic is preserved, then we need a timing and power sign off. So the RC extraction that we use, right, we'll be having spef file from there and then use that spef info and run a timing analysis and power analysis. So with timing analysis, we'll need to make sure that my setup time is not violating, my hold time is not violating. If there is any violation, we'll need to fix the same. We'll need to optimize the uh, design and fix any violation that is coming here. Okay. Similarly, we'll also need to verify the power numbers, the power sign off. So we'll need to make sure that the power is still in the given criteria that, that came as a requirement in the starting. Okay. If these numbers are also fine, then we can go ahead with the GDS2 generation and send the GTS2 to foundry. This procedure is called tape out. So tape out happens means we are providing now the GTS2 to the IC foundry and they'll be developing an IC for you. So these are all the steps that we do for an ASIC design. Okay. Now uh, uh, let's talk about these steps a little bit more. So we saw right, there are various steps that we run. So there, there were all the steps to be performed uh, for the uh, ASIC design, right? To carry out all these operations, right? How much time it would take? So the time taken could be months, right? It's okay. So the time taken could be months. Usually it, it's months only, okay? And it is also an iterative process because let's suppose after synthesis or after uh, placement and route, your uh, logic equivalence check failed. Okay, so in that case, what would happen? Then we'll need to go back to synthesis or we'll need to go back to uh, place and route and fix the uh, non EQ, right? So it would also be iterative. So it will require a lot of time and the resources. Okay, so, um, and also when I'm talking about resources, right? What's happening is that it's not a single designer who is uh, running all these steps from RTL to GDS2. So basically what's happening is that uh, there will be a group of engineers working on each and every step of it. Let's suppose, uh, for example, of RTL design. Okay, so for RTL design, what would happen is that um, it will not be a simple code like vending machine. Nowadays, the chips that we have are mainly SOCs. The entire system comes on a single chip itself. So there will be multiple blocks that are there and for all those blocks, there will be different RTL designers who will be designing this block itself. Okay, so it will go to different designers. And uh, similarly, if you talk about other stages like synthesis, uh, place and route, logic equivalence check. So there also there will be a group of engineers working on. This. So there would be a lot of resources that goes into this uh, ASIC designing, right? So it's a very much time consuming and uh, it's, uh, it also requires a lot of resource. Now let's assume that we are in the end of our design cycle, okay? And at the end or near to the end, you came to know that there was one functionality missing in the RTL itself, okay? And uh, then what would happen? then we cannot start the process from the scratch, right? Then it would be again months of process and uh, uh, it would also take a lot of resource again, right? So to take care of that, we should have some process which could fix it at that stage itself. We, we should not be wanting it to do from the scratch. 
because as i mentioned earlier right it's not reprogrammable the sick sick is not reprogrammable that you would go into it and then just fix the problem right there itself right rtl was a reference and those it's self missing a functionality so we should be having an option that can allow us to fix the problem there or let's take another scenario what's happening is that we did a keep out for a chip but the new requirement that has come now is a small functionality addition on the previous chip itself okay then in that case what we could do we if we start from the scratch then again it would be a time taking and a uh, lot of resources would be required okay so the basic idea here or the basic goal here is that explore the what if possibilities that can accelerate my rtl to gds2 scenario when there is a small rtl change only okay so if this small rtl change can be implemented using a small metal change or a small functionality addition then it can save us a lot of resource a lot of manpower if not then we'll need to start from the scratch and then do each and every process again involving all the manpower all the resources etc so the process of implementing this change in the later st later stage itself is called ecu okay so that's what we do with ecu instead of starting from scratch we can have some changes implemented in the end of the cycle itself now since we are talking about only a small delta change right so it could it would seem like that yes we can do it manually itself but the manual uh, implementation of eco might have some or will have some series of problems as well so let's look at the problems that we might face with a manual eco approach so first of all the process would require a lot of time and resources because we can uh, add the change as a behavioral code in the rtl but we'll also need to make the changes in the netlist right because the later stages are all netlist post uh, synthesis netlist post layout netlist so we'll need to make sure that each and every wire connection has been taken care of so while connecting the wires it can become an iterative process like out of 10 connection we missed one or we uh, did a wrong connection in one of them that it would become a reiterative process so it could require a lot of time and resources and because of that the next problem that the flow is very much prone to the human errors because there can be a wrong connection that we can make right so in that case there would be various errors that we might be finding again and again the biggest problem is with manual eco approach is that how to get an optimized eco patch now what do i mean with optimized eco patch so if you recall in the previous slides we talked about that my design should be timing area and power clean right so at those stages we were using some uh, simulation software synthesis software or uh, place and route software so those were taking care of it automatically you could run with one single command you could fix with one single command right but here we are changing the netlist manually that would mean that if i am doing a change i'll need to be aware of that how it is going to affect my timing or power or area right so that's the biggest uh, problem that we see with manual eco approach and the other problem is that it's very difficult to make use of spare gates in the design when we are doing it manually so what does spare gates mean spare gates means that in the design itself right we might be having some uh, cells that we left intentionally there without any connection or we might be uh, deleting some logic as well right so while deleting the logic we are getting some free cells so how to make sure that we are able to use those free cells as well while doing this manual eco so there could be series of challenges with manual eco so it's better to opt for an automation of eco implementation okay so that's all about the eco manual approach let's go through the nomenclature this is my last slide for today so uh, as we talked about engineering change order or eco is the process of making local or small delta changes in the design at least without rerunning the entire synthesis and placement and route flow so instead what we will be doing is that we will be uh, making the change in rtl and go to a intermediate synthesis netlist we will not be going through the entire synthesis just take a netlist and then we will be uh, transferring the changes from the intermediate netlist to the place and route netlist okay so that's how we do the eco there are two types of eco that we have 
uh, functional ECO and non-functional ECO. Functional ECO, as the name suggests, that we'll be changing the functionality of our design. So we can either add some new functionality or remove the functionality which was earlier present. So with functional ECO, we are changing the functionality of the design. Non-functional ECO. Non-functional ECO are basically to uh, fix the timing violations or the DRV or routing violations with minimal effort. That would mean that we are not changing the functionality. What we are doing is that changing the cell type. Maybe increase the drive strength, decrease the drive strength. And uh, uh, we could also like add a buffer chain, invert the chain, which is not changing the functionality. So that we can do with non-functional ECO, okay? We also have two ECO stages where we can perform ECO, pre-mask ECO and post-mask ECO. So pre-mask flow is basically what we talked about today. So where we talked about that we will use normal logic gates to, uh, to implement the design. So we'll use normal logic gates to implement the changes as well in the ECO. That would be pre-mask ECO or pre-tape out ECO, right? So we could use the library cells, add some new library cells, implement the new functionality that we need, that would be call, uh, called as pre-mask ECO. The second one is post-mask ECO. Now for understanding post-mask ECO, we'll need to understand what post-mask design is. Okay, so uh, if you had any, uh, if you have had any fabrication courses, then uh, in that you might be able to recall that there was one step called masking. So in masking, what we used to do is that we could we would take our dye and place a mask on top of it and then bombard with the UV rays. So what would happen? There would be a pattern that gets formed on the dye. So that pattern is basically my logic, right? So now that logic is on my dye. We cannot change the logic right now. The only thing that we can change is how we are connecting that logic. So the routing is still needed. We'll need to fill the metal for the connections, right? So that's my post-mask design, where the logic is already formed on the die. The only thing that we have control over is how to connect all these logic. So that's why it's also, also called metal only issue. Because at this stage, the only thing we have control over is the routing or the metal filling. So we cannot add a new logic gate in, in it, but instead we can use the logic gates available in the design itself to make the functionality change. That's why we put some spare gates as well. So that some logics are there, uh, without any functionality. We can just use them for any upcoming functionality. Okay, so that's the post-mask ECO. Uh, that's all that I had for today. So we talked about the SIG design step. We also talked about why we need ECO and at what stages we can perform ECO. If you have any questions, we can take all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwarya for a nice presentation. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Do we have any questions? Hello? Yes. I saw that, uh, one question. Sorry, your voice is breaking for me. One portion from ma'am. So okay, okay. Here. Sure, sure. Um, could you show the uh, side of flowchart again? Just tell me the slide number or um, the topic. Maybe first or second. First or second itself. This one? No, before that, the flowchart. Side actually, I don't okay. It was fourth number, madam. Okay, okay, and ma'am, that uh, side which was having that uh, bending machine that was okay, fifth okay, one, okay. No? okay, okay, okay. I'll just make it okay. Clear. Actually, uh, yeah. yes. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Actually, you switch over very fast, too, so I was not able to follow. That's why. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yes. it's, it's clear right now, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. If you want, I can I can explain as well. If you want the explanation. Again. Uh, in the requirements part, uh, you're told about, uh, these are the criteria which you have to consider when you're going to design the, I think, 
a functionality area and frequency operation so these are the requirements let's suppose uh, like for our mobile camera chip right the functionality would be that we want to take picture then it would come like what pixels which kind of camera you want like that right? so those functionalities will come yes specification okay and uh, about the area and frequency area and frequency would mean like uh, before getting the phone design right uh, the designers will have an idea that this much size i want right so that this much size is, they will this area you are talking about is the area which huh, i am uh, chip will require or yes the uh, chip will require this okay, this is okay. the area which the chip will require so they will have a, a uh design made that this much how much i can have for camera chip this much how much i can have for uh, uh, like codec chip so like that there, there would be a dimensions available and similarly frequency will be something like maybe megahertz or kilohertz depending upon how fast my chip will be working yes right? yes okay. it was a very good presentation ma'am thank you and it was nice talking to you as well great question any other questions yes. no no ma'am i think in now for today session thank you so much ashwarya for a nice presentation thank you so much thank you alisa